How should we respond to false teachers in the church or blatant, let's just call it what it is, heresy? You know, when people are saying things about God and his nature that aren't true. I'm just talking about some of the basic principles of the Christian faith. When people take a stance on the Bible, basically undermining its authority, undermining its truthfulness, its it, its usefulness, certainly the Bible is useful. I recently got some pushback from a video that I had made about popular teacher, Andy <gasps> Stanley, who honestly I've, I've taken issue with the last couple of years because of statements that he's made. I used to be, 20 years ago, I was an Andy Stanley fan. He is the son of Charles Stanley, shocking to me. I, I honestly, I, I'm not even sure what his Bible degree is, if he has one or not, but the, the man has just made some statements that are straight up awful, saying that we need to unhitch the Old Testament from the New Testament. Things like this are problematic just on multiple levels. They, they really undermine the authority of God's word. They show also an incredible lack of understanding about the Bible, just about basic like Christian principle. Like how do we know who Jesus was? Why did Jesus have significance? Why can we trust his words? It's it's because of all this this previous revelation that God gave us in the Old Testament. The the Bible is not just a spiritual book, it's a history book. And so it's 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 incredible in that regard. It, it's it's more incredible than any other religious text that's out there because it was written over a period of 1500 years by multiple different authors and it's just incredible. So all of this this revelation builds and calls culminates with the coming of Christ, and Christ has significance, and we know that he's the Christ because of the preceding revelation. Getting back to Andy Stanley, like, why do I have this issue with him? Well, increasingly, he's made these statements, these also uh, affirming statements, not just what he said about the Bible. Part of the problem in Christianity is that when we grew up, we were taught the Bible. I heard that this was the Word of God, and I've always believed that. I've heard that it was infallible, and I've always believed that. I heard that it was inerrant. There were no mistakes. And I believe that. I heard that it was all inspired. You know, Adam and Eve and Jesus and Noah and Moses and Jesus coming back, it's all equal. It's all in equal terms. Because it was all presented as, as one holistic thing, which it is not, because we never even understood where this came from. And we discovered that even though it was sacred, it wasn't scientific. And even though, you know, it was something to appreciate, it wasn't necessarily something that was factual. And even though there were stories in here that were inspirational, they weren't necessarily true. The Bible says, in quotes. The Bible says is not an adequate starting point or returning point for many adults. Also affirming statements. Oh my goodness, a gay man or woman who wants to worship their heavenly father who did not answer the cry of their heart when they were 12 and 13 and 14 and 15. God said no, and they still love God. We have some things to learn from a group of men and women who love Jesus that much. And how us Christians and us church people, we're so bad and and these people are this particular demographic. They are, they're the true heroes of society because sometimes they still come to church even though we're mean to them. And I know the verses, I know the clobber passages. A gay person who still wants to attend church after the way the church has treated the gay community, I'm telling you, they have more faith than I do. They have more faith than a lot of you. That's, that's a ridiculous statement in and of itself. Like, I don't know any church that is mean to the gay community. Like, not a single church. I'm just being real. I've never seen it happen. Like, literally never. Not one time. I'm a, I'm a pastor of 24 years. Actually, 24 years yesterday. Holy crap. August 1st of 2000 is when I went into pastoral ministry. I was just a youth pastor back then. Didn't have all my degrees that I got now. But ministry for 24 years. I've never seen, in my opinion, in the churches I've visited, Christians are the most welcoming people. We always want to reach out. And thankfully, we're not perfect. That means we're relatable, but Christians got the best hearts. They're the most giving people. Historically, Christians have created and shaped Western culture. So before I, before I rip the church, I want to be respectful of what these things have brought to culture and the culture that we know today, that currently the people who are undermining it are trying to destroy. L literally, they're trying to destroy it. By destroying the foundation, we're going to see the whole building collapse. And, and really, that's ultimately what they want. So in my mind's eye, preachers that are like Andy Stanley, this is what they're trying to do. Part of the problem in Christianity is that when we grew up, we were taught the Bible. Nonetheless, I've taken issue with Andy Stanley and with a few others. 
Recently, I even reviewed one of his sermons. I actually watched the entire sermon, critiqued it, and then I received pushback in the form of YouTube comments. For example, at I Love Pie Do You Too wrote, I'm halfway through this video, so I admittedly don't have the full picture on Andy's sermon, but I think you should stick to talking about the content of the sermon rather than the way he says things. There's nothing effeminate about waving your hands around a certain way. Plus, a lot of your mockery of him seemed really unnecessary and unkind. Now, what she's referring to is, I believe I actually used the word effeminate that I think he, and and honestly, I would say other preachers too. I see this, this is rampant today. Male preachers using effeminate mannerisms. And, And what I mean by that is being apologetic about everything. Like, I'm sorry, did you want me to speak to you? I'm sorry about, I I don't want this to come across the wrong way. Like, in my opinion, not only are you not acting like a man, you're acting like you have no confidence, and you're probably pandering a little bit. So this is what I meant by effeminate. You know, certainly there's certain waving of the hand motions and things like that that are more feminine, and this is something that, in my opinion, I saw in Andy in this video. It bothered me a little bit. It just bothers me in general when I think preachers don't have confidence. When we engage the pulpit, certainly we should not have a confidence in ourselves. We should be filled with the confidence of Christ. But God also calls us to be manly in our preaching. And and by that, I don't mean that each and every person that ascends the pulpit needs to be John Wayne or needs to be, you know, from my generation, Arnold Schwarzenegger. That's not what I'm saying. I'm, I'm just saying that it's not just about the, the hand motions. It's about the demeanor. It's about the apologeticness. Like, I felt like I was watching a sermon by a woman at a woman's conference when I was listening to Andy. And so I'm just being honest. I don't, I don't think he... I don't even know that that's a good comparison because I think a woman at a woman's conference would have done a better job than Andy did in his sermon to a mixed crowd. I just think he lacked confidence. I think that um, it, he was too apologetic. Th- this is what I mean by uh, effeminate. And so, you know, you have a problem with that. Um, I, I don't know what to tell you because I, I don't really feel like in my heart I was mocking somebody else, but I would never do that intentionally to someone. I also think if I were correcting a false teacher, then mockery is actually on the table. Biblically speaking, it is, especially when we're talking to a people that should know better. Look look at Elijah, the way that he mocked, openly mocked, and I don't think I did anything near this in my video, the prophets of Baal. He says, is is your God taking a poop? (laughs) Is he going to the bathroom? You know, like he's, he's literally openly mocking them. Maybe he can't hear you chant louder. Like he's fueling the fire of just, you know, making fun of them. And, and, and rightly so. I mean, they were about to be put to death. Was it? Wow. That, that's a whole, that's another stage. They actually slaughtered the prophets of Baal. I, wow. Am I saying we should get a bunch of swords and go out and start, you know, killing the, no, the false prophets. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that in the Bible, I think we see a different ethic than we're accustomed to in modern America. So go back and watch my video. I don't believe I did anything on that level of mockery in the video. Did I laugh at a couple of points? Absolutely. In fact, I think I made a joke at one point about the Michael Jordan meme because of something that he said, and it, it did. It triggered in my mind the Michael Jordan meme. Stop it, because I think he said stop it in his sermon, and I I just I thought it was funny. Am I not allowed to laugh at that? Does that mean I'm mocking somebody? No, I laugh at myself all the time. I make fun of myself. I do have the right to criticize somebody who I believe has crossed that line into becoming a false prophet, especially when it comes to matters that flirt with heresy, because this stuff is destructive for the church. There was also at Sean Lawless, 8277, who said, I have a young person who wants my perspective on Mr. Stanley, so I came across your video. I I don't know if this is a person in his house or, you know, maybe he's a youth pastor. I don't know. I'm watching it in spite of your commentary. Ouch. And I can't take it anymore. Don't do it, man. Don't jump off the cliff. There's hope in Jesus. I'm sure I can just YouTube actual sermons. You barely have a handle on the heretical aspects you address, but you really spend most of your time insulting and mocking. 
Okay. To watch your video is to sit in the seat of a mocker. That's Psalm 1. It doesn't matter if you stumble into a few truths in your vitriol. Yikes. Well, at least he's admitting that I'm speaking a few truths. Your real emphasis is mockery. You spend most of your time doing it. Your, quote, orthodox explanations are so rudimentary and oversimplified that they are barely useful. You should change the topic of your video to, quote, Pastor AJ's views and opinions about people he thinks he's better than. Well, hey, Sean Lawless 8277, why don't you tell me how you really feel? Because I just want to take a moment to tell you that I think your characterization of me is completely and comprehensively unjust. If you were looking to Andy Stanley's sermons, I would encourage you not to do so for the very reason that I actually just said, because I think the man has delved into the heretical. These are issues that, believe it or not, I actually have a solid foundation for. I have a solid understanding of issues of the nature of God, issues of the canon of Scripture, and the importance of you know the, the Scriptures being the infallible, inerrant Word of God. Part of the problem in Christianity is that when we grew up, we were taught the Bible. The way in which covenantal theology seems sort of a streamlining of the Bible, looking at it more so as just one unit from Old Testament to New Testament. Because it was all presented as, as one holistic thing, which it is not, because we never even understood where this came from. I do have a good handle on things, and it's because of the handle that I have that I can definitively say the man is really flirting with the heretical. He is on the verge of, if not already, a heretic. I would not encourage anybody to listen to his sermons. I would not encourage any Christians to fellowship with him. I would encourage him to repent of his gross, negligent undermining of God's holy and perfect word. And even though there were stories in here that were inspirational, they weren't necessarily true. And of his abuse of the church by pandering to, with his effeminate mannerisms and preaching style, that community which he is affirming. A gay person, they have more faith than I do. They have more faith than a lot of you. They don't need sensitivity. They need rebuke so that they can repent and come to know God, and so does Andy Stanley. And just in case you think I'm making this up, take a look at his response. My assertion of his arrogance kind of goes back to this interview where he was explaining this idea of unhitching the old from the New Testament. It, it, it fits into a lot of what leftist media types are doing to Christians today with the gaslighting, because basically in his explanation for this, he says to people, I'm smarter than you. I know more than you. And I really wasn't saying that. Well, no, you really did say that. And I've heard you on multiple occasions say other stuff about how the Old Testament's the Old Testament. I don't, I don't teach the Old Testament. I don't like to talk about the Old Testament. I'm paraphrasing, but that's what the man said. And this is the kind of stuff that dishonest, shady people do. It, it's a sleight of hand. It's, it's basically slapping you in the face and then telling you that they didn't just slap you in the face. And the more you press them on the issue, they start to make you think you're crazy because you think they just slapped you in the face. What do you okay. mean by unhitching the Christianity well, from the Old Testament? I don't want to spend too much time on this. So just interrupt me if this goes too long. <laughs> that was a term I used in a particular sermon in a particular series, I guess really almost actually actually a year ago. I had just done a 12-part series through the life of Jesus leading up to resurrection, and it was going well. So I thought, hey, I'll spend three weeks and just keep story going narrative-wise through Acts. So I spent three weeks on Acts. So in the message in Acts 15, where I talked about the Jerusalem Council and this momentous decision to, and the word I used was unhitch Christianity from the Sinai covenant, from circumcision, and again, whatever, I mean, everybody knows something happened there that was of extraordinary significance for the church. I used the word unhitch. And then to tease my next series, which was called The Bible for Grownups, I, I made the comment, hey, and perhaps those of us modern Christians, I forget the exact words, we need to consider, we need to unhitch our Christianity from the Old Testament as well, kind of paralleling that there was a momentous detachment from what it meant to be a Jesus follower for Gentiles, that perhaps we need to think through some of those things ourselves. And so just pay attention to what he's saying here. He's basically expl explaining his comments away <laughs> by saying, I need to, you know, I just was having a sermon one day, and, and what this did, it's not a big deal. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but you know, what I said was we need to unhitch 
the Old Testament. And so, you know, just, just think about the implications of that for a second. You know, it's, it's the difference between Jesus saying the law is fulfilled, whether it's the law of circumcision or the sacrifices or temple worship, this kind of, it's fulfilled. Now, the, the moral law w- was fulfilled in the sense that Christ did it for us, but we're still obligated to keep the moral law. So that that's not in debate here. What we're talking about is is the Old Testament circumcision, these things that God gave his people as a foreshadowing of stuff that we currently experience. And so these things were fulfilled in Christ where we don't have to do them anymore, but we still have to practice the spiritual realities of being circumcised in our hearts. So what I take issue with here and what other people take issue with is the casual way Andy talks about it and, and this this issue of unhitching as though it's just a trailer and they let it go. They didn't let it go. It was fulfilled in Christ. And the Old Testament is a very necessary foundation for New Testament faith. It really was a tease. In fact, in the message I said, and we will come back and talk about this tease. more in the next few weeks. Well, and understandably so. People took that phrase and it sort of became the banner That'd under be which— That would be fun, a, a tease, like, you know, like just kind of end, uh, end a sermon one week with, um, uh, yeah, you don't really need faith to be saved, you know, or you can be a murderer and God doesn't care. Now come back and we'll unpack that in the next several weeks. <laughs> which I do all <laughs> ministry. What's with that? And interestingly enough, in our churches, everyone was scratching their heads like, why is this such a big deal? Because I teach from the Old Testament— all the time. In fact, that next series was a four-part series, and two were from the book of Genesis. So in terms of my track record, nothing could be further from the truth that I don't teach from the Old Testament, don't think the Old Testament points to Jesus. All the things people keep reminding me of on social media, I'm like, I know. And if you actually paid attention to my history of preaching, you'd know that. Okay, so there you go. There's the the gaslighting. There's the, you know, you're really misunderstanding me. You know, it's, it's like the abuser telling the abused, it's your fault that you're abused or, or you're not really being abused. (laughs) You know, that, that's kind of what, what I feel like when I listen to him talk, I just get this feeling like when he does this, it's like, he's actually saying I'm smarter than you. So long story short is I stand by what I said. I don't think Andy is expressing a good hermeneutic for the Bible and interpreting the Bible. He seems to be trying to reach unbelievers so much that he's really dismantling the very foundation that you would use to reach them. So heretical stuff, I think things that um, other people have noticed I'm not the only one. You'll find a lot of videos on this. So don't hate the messenger. Uh, That's all I got, friends. I just wanted to do a quick response to some of that stuff. God bless you and uh, have a great weekend. I will see you in my next video. Peace. Hey guys, Pastor AJ here, and thanks for visiting my channel. If you don't mind, I'm going to take just a sec to tell you about Gospel Ministries and our mission to help others experience, demonstrate, and share God's great gospel. If you want, you can pick up some of our merch in our YouTube store to help you communicate that same gospel message. And I'd love it if you would consider subscribing to this channel so that we can challenge your Christian walk through solid biblical teaching as it applies to culture and other issues. In addition to that, you can go to PastorAJ.com where you can consider partnering with this ministry and sign up for my weekly email newsletter. Don't forget, I'm on all other social media platforms at Pastor AJ Platt. One other item that might interest you has to do with a topic that I've studied pretty extensively. It's my book, End Times Mission that will give you a solid education on the different views of eschatology and, more importantly, your role in Jesus' kingdom while we wait for his return. This book covers the historical origins of popular end times teachings as it guides the reader to Christ's current reign in a post-millennial worldview. Oh, and one last thing. I want you to know that you know Jesus. So if you'd like to, leave a comment or send me a message so that I can help you do just that because... The gospel is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes.